Pastor Becky. I am here at Heartland Church in the middle of Giving Hope, and we are so excited to share with you what's happening at Heartland. And so what our church members did is we went shopping for the community, and we're having a Christmas party with a shopping mall just for them. So families are coming in, they're buying gifts for their kids, they're getting a dinner to take home with them, and we're talking to them about Jesus, we're praying for them, and every kid gets a Bible before they leave. We are all about loving people to life in Jesus Christ, and we are so excited to be changing our community one family at a time. I'm Carter, um, this is my wife, Janina. We were uh, met by Miss Donna, who came in and she um, took care of us. She took us around, um, showed us the church, showed us the love that you guys um, have in this church. And it's, it's, it was pretty amazing. Well, I'm grateful because we didn't expect anything. We didn't know what to expect. Um, our school, our children's school principal had uh, mentioned something to us and I didn't know what she was up to. I just said, sure, why not? You know, normally we're that family that is being a blessing to everybody else. But this year, last year and this year, and I'm not gonna get emotional, but we weren't able to do that. And their principal, when she came to me, I was kind of taken back for a second because we weren't in the position to do anything. And so what's so amazing is we had been talking about finding somewhere to fellowship at. And I mentioned having heard about Heartland at some point. Didn't even know that this is what Mrs. Reed was up to <laughs> from the school. Um, but we get here and from the time that we were entering the parking lot, the, the greeters in the parking lot, their hearts were warm. And then getting in and Miss Donna met us at the door. And everything that everybody's been able to help us out with, with our children this year, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, let's declare this together today. We sing. God is alive in me. Holy Spirit inside of me. What an amazing time this is for our church. We have a great story of a woman that came here sharing with us the tough times that she's going through with going into the hospital in and out and doesn't have time to really go shopping for her children. When it comes time to pick up her Bible for her child, she picks up a Bible and starts to write a little note for her daughter. And she sees on the inside cover of the Bible, Proverbs 3, verse five through six. It's the same verse that she would recite as a young girl growing up going to church. It's just a reminder to her that God has her right where she needs to be. So I thank you, Heartland Church, for just pouring into our community, buying gifts, volunteering, everything that you do is for our community and to share the love of Christ with our neighbors. So thank you, Heartland Church, for all that you do. Come on, everybody, is that amazing or what? I gotta tell you, I love this church, and it was so neat yesterday to see so many different people, so many different races and backgrounds, and just all coming together to love people to life in Jesus Christ. You guys mean the world to me, and over 200 of you of our church serving yesterday, uh, amazing. I just, I just can't even tell you thank you enough uh, from the bottom of my heart, and uh, I, I know she's home today resting because these last few weeks have been grueling for her in every sense of the word. So will you let Pastor Becky Porter, who's watching today, know how much you love her. She is an amazing, amazing woman. We love you, Pastor Becky. Thanks for having the vision to move the ball forward in this area. She is over all of our missions and outreach and local outreach. It's, this is, seriously, I mean this when I say this. It's been the greatest year of us making a difference in our community. And uh, I sat down with Pastor Becky several years ago. And we started dreaming 
about things that we could do. And, but really, Pastor Becky's the hands and the feet. She's the one that has helped make that happen. And I'm so grateful to her and to Tiana, who's carried the ball so much with this. And all of our team leads, you guys, uh, really are uh, amazing. So before I do anything else, I want to look into the camera today uh, at Chipotle, uh, which is my restaurant of choice. Yesterday evening, as I left Giving Hope, uh, I walked into line, and there was a lady there, and she said, Pastor Dusty, and uh, I looked over, and uh, so to Jamie, who's been watching during this pandemic the last two years online, uh, I want you to know your church loves you today. Come on, Heartland family, help me welcome them to church. And it's so important to know that every story has a name. And every name matters to God, everybody, uh, every family. And we're just so thankful if you're watching or if you're brand new to our church today, uh, welcome. We're so thankful. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, this week uh, because we are kind of entering into that unique time of the year. Um, and we do have three Christmas services that we're doing for you this, this week There'll be candle lighting and great music, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a second, but we've kind of uh, messed with the service times a little bit. So we're doing a Thursday night experience. For those of you who start traveling on Christmas Eve, uh, you can come the day before Christmas Eve if you'd like to. It's 7 p.m. This is a one-hour service that we do. Uh, and then Friday, December 24th, that's Christmas Eve, at 2 and at 4. Now, we used to do 4 and 6. However, we kind of started talking about it as a team, and we thought we'd offer an earlier experience for those of you who just you get out. And if you've never been to one of our Christmas uh, experiences before, they're a lot of fun. Uh, we have some really funny stuff. We have some uh, great songs. And then, honestly, my favorite tradition is when Pastor Dan Dean gets up on that grand piano, uh, and he, start, he just has a way of putting me in the feels uh, for Christmas every year. And, of course, our Christmas table that's uh, got tons of cookies out in the lobby and hot chocolate. Just a lot of fun. I hope that you'll come uh, and bring somebody to church with you. It's the easiest time of the year uh, for people to, to say yes to come to church and give them the service times and say, which one do you want to go to? I'll go to that one uh, and make room for them, and it'll be awesome. And then the following Sunday, which is a couple days later, uh, because of the amount of things that we've done, it's been a very busy season in our church. Many of you have served. We're doing what we call Sabbath Sunday. And Sabbath Sunday is really meant to give all of our dream teamers a Sunday to rest and to stay home and to spend time with family. Now, we still are doing an experience. We're just doing it online. So it'll be all online that day, and you can go 9 30, 11 30, 2, 6, 8, and 10 all throughout the days. Those will be on uh, either on our Facebook page or live.theheartlandchurch.com. You can go to our website and go right uh, to one of those services. About 40 minutes long. We're trying to keep it short because we know you're going to have turkey and you're going to get, you know, a lot of just. All that going on, you know, while you're eating. So we want you to watch this. And then uh, 21 days of prayer and fasting beginning January 9th. Uh, and I will just tell you this. I know some of you do travel on, on January 2nd, uh, which is it's right after the new year. I, I want you to know that I, I, was, I was getting a little bit worried uh, because I had asked the Lord for kind of a direction to start the year. And I hadn't really heard it. And this past Tuesday, I got that. Uh, and I, I have just uh, this whole January, I feel like the Lord has spoken to me, but the message on the second is going to set up everything else we do for the rest of the month. So if you're able to hear it, even if you're not here in person because you're traveling or whatever, just go on our app or go online or go during the week and podcast it and listen to it so it can set up uh, the rest of the month for you. All right, so today, I, I, it's not usually a Sunday I speak, just to be real honest. Um, it's Christmas week, and so during Christmas week, I'm usually very focused uh, on what I'm going to talk about uh, during our Christmas services. However, uh, I had a little bit more time than usual uh, to kind of think about that because I was out uh, with my health for two months. And uh, so you're just going to get me on a Sunday today you normally don't get me on, if that's okay, because uh, I, I wanted to share today. But I, I've, I've got a message that uh, has really been on my heart, and I touched on it very briefly in an email that I sent out to all of our partners this week. And I try really hard not to send you very much uh, stuff. I know you get bombarded 
in your emails. But if you're one of our partners of our church and you have an email with us, I, I send it to those specific people. Uh, and usually I do it once a month or something like that. It's just kind of a note of encouragement, just something that's on my heart that I'm thinking about, just something to help you uh, in your life. And I touched on it in one of those emails, uh, and I just try not to bog you down. So, uh, But I, I hope they encourage you. But I shared some ways to just kind of cr- keep the Christmas cheer because how many people know the swings of the season are very real, you know, this time of the year? You can go from cheer and nostalgia and laughter into loneliness and regret and depression real, real fast. And in fact, studies show that you're actually more in touch with your pain during the holiday season than at any other time of the year. And I, and I don't think it's that you necessarily have more pain. I just think you're in touch with it more. And I don't have a great explanation for that, except for maybe you're just around some of the people who've caused that pain. Uh, and so you're feeling it a little. Studies, studies show that um, pe- more people commit suicide between Thanksgiving and Christmas than the rest of the year combined. And then you couple that just with the impact of COVID and, and so many people in our church and with relatives and people that they've lost and, and stuff that's happened. And man, I'm just going to tell you, it's, it's been heavy. So here's what I just want to do today is I just want to take a Sunday and I'm going to tell you, this is a real pastoral message. Uh, so, some Sundays I teach you, some Sundays I try to make you laugh uh, or inspire you. I just want to pastor you as you get ready for this week and the next week. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to go to Isaiah 1. If you don't, that's okay. Hopefully you got a handout when you came in today. If you didn't get that, they're on uh, our app. And uh, you can always find the message notes. And you can take notes and then email them to yourself. Or uh, I've got my screen here. And you'll be able to see them here on the screen with me today. But in this scripture in Isaiah 1, God makes an appeal And I want to make that same appeal to you today. And so Isaiah 1 just says this, come now, let's settle this. Everybody say those two words with me that are highlighted in yellow. Come on, real loud today, say, settle this. There you go, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I'm going to make them as white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, I'm going to make them white as wool. And then he says this, if you will uh, only obey me. Let's, let's settle this. I, wanna, I want somebody in this room to settle something in their heart when they leave out of here today. I don't want you to go another Christmas with whatever that is that's just ugly in your heart. I want you to settle it once and for all today. And then he gives you this picture of, of what it's like in your life, that your sins are like, like scarlet. I think the word picture is like, it's like you're bleeding, you know, from the sin in your life. And he promises to turn that, that that which is a bloody mess, so to speak. The promises, his promises are yes and amen. He promises to turn it into something white, into something pure, into something that is a beautiful picture. I love that word picture, from red into white. But notice that that transition can only come in your life with a caveat. And the caveat is obedience. Come on, somebody. Like, like, isn't that interesting today? That obedience, by the way, obedience is always mentioned where obedience is hard. If it, if it weren't hard, you wouldn't have to be worrying about being obedient. It's like, you know, come on, you live a long life if you eat healthy. Come on. How many people know that's always the challenge? In fact, I'll just say this, that almost nothing that I'm going to say to you today It's just going to be like, well, that's easy. You know, I could just do that, you know, because the truth is you're not going to want to do any of it. It's counterintuitive. It's it's countercultural. It it takes a choice in your life, the choice to, to let God begin to do a work and to heal the pain of your life. If your current level of thinking and obedience was enough, you wouldn't be in any pain right now. But it hasn't been, therefore, you need a new way of thinking, you got to think differently, and so I want to talk about pain today. But but maybe I want to I want to talk about pain in a much different way than maybe you were thinking. I don't want to talk about necessarily the pain that's happened to you, although we can apply this message to that as well. And if you need to, that's fine. But I want to talk about the pain that we put on ourselves. Yes. I want to just mention this and hit on this 
Because I think around Christmas, it's a big issue for a lot of people. I have this friend right now that is in a season of grieving. And uh, I've been praying for them and, and trying my best to walk next to them as best I can. And I was with them the other day. And just to be completely honest, I was a little anxious because I know they're grieving. And so I wanted to be a blessing and I wanted to be helpful. And in the middle of me being with them, I just made a comment that was so stupid. Anybody relate to this, you know? Just ignorant and dumb, and as soon as I said it, it's like my heart went to my stomach. And I walked over away from them, and I thought to myself, you, you dummy, why'd you say that, you know? And I went home that night, and the rest of the night, all I could think about was that stupid comment, that stupid Dusty, you just stupid, why'd you stupid, stupid? And I'm sitting here, and I'm thinking that to myself, and... And then the next day I wake up and I'm thinking about it again. And I'm just like, ah, I don't even know if they knew that I said it. I don't even know if they thought it was dumb too. But all I can think about is I said it. And so they probably, think, anybody real know what I'm talking about right now? I ever had this battle going on within them? And I got to my office and I was, I was working on Mondays. I usually prep both for the week and for future weeks. I, I would use the whole day as a prep day. And I, I got to the office and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And said, that right there. And I, I said, what does that mean? <laughs> and I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me and say, that right there, I want you to talk about that. Because people do that to themselves all the time. Yes, because for some of us in this room today, the greatest source of pain is not just, hap is, is not just what happens to us. It's things that we did at some point in our lives that we cannot let go of. For some of you here today, the holiday season is hard, not because of something someone else did, but because of something that you did. And Pastor Dusty, I can forgive others, and I can, I can forgive when someone hurts me, but I just can't forgive myself. In fact, I hate myself for the things that I've done. I hate the pain. That I've caused. In fact, I, I was with a guy not too long ago, and across the table, I, I told him as we were talking, I said, I just feel like you're dealing with so much shame right now. It's like when you talk, shame just comes out of your mouth. And he said, oh, that's an issue for me. And he said, honestly, it affects my relationship with God because I hear you say that God loves me, but I can't understand why God would love me. And I, I just started wrestling this week with this idea of how do you get past that? How do you deal with pain that you've inflicted and pain that you feel like is on you? It kind of, as I started thinking about it, I, I started thinking about, you guys, it's the season, so you know that movie, A Christmas Carol, you know, Charles Dickens, lots of, my favorite was the Muppets version, of course, when I was growing up. <laughs> if you're a 90s kid, you know what I'm talking about in the room right now. But... You know that Scrooge is visited by three ghosts, one of them the first ghost, the ghost of Christmas, the ghost of Christmas past. And I'm just, I'm going to contend to you today that I think we suffer a little bit from a ghost from our past that speaks to us. The truth is, is, is you have ghosts and, and these ghosts, these spirits, they, they try to, they speak to you, <laughs> they haunt you, I guess you could even say with a distortion. It's a distortion of the truth. They're lying to you. That's what the enemy does. In fact, I thought about this this week that some of you have wreaths in, in your home right now. What's a wreath? A wreath is garland that has been twisted to form the shape of a circular, uh, of a, a circular shape. And you take that and you hang it in your house. Well, some of us have spirits that have twisted the truth. And you've taken that twisted truth and you've hung it in the window of your heart. You started to believe something about yourself that was never meant to be true, but the enemy's distorted it to now you believe that it's true about you and your thinking is, has become totally twisted. And so what we need to do for a few minutes today, in my opinion, is we have to start untwisting that which has been twisted. The problem for most of us is, is when we get to unhealthy thinking, we start to do all sorts of unhealthy things with it. In fact, I'll give you a couple of these. The first thing that we do with our pain that's unhealthy is we try to bury it. 
If I just bury it, if I just try to, like, it never happened. I just try to act like it's in my imagination or it's just not there anymore. It'll go away. But the truth is time doesn't heal all wounds. Only the Holy Spirit can heal all wounds. You just try to bury it. You just try to sweep it under a rug. You try to throw that skeleton in the closet. That skeleton will open the door and come visit you at night. I just freak some little kid out in this room. It'll haunt you, but you've got to let it be healed. Look at the verse in Proverbs 28. It says, he who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Don't conceal it. I deal with this with a lot of men, and in this church, I try to model it, and I try to challenge men to live different than our culture tries to present an image of men to live. And that is that, that if you're a man, men are just tough and We don't talk about our feelings and we just stuff them. And I'm not saying you have to hold a puppy and, (laughs) you know, cry and talk about your feelings. But I think there's somewhere in the middle of that, you know, where you talk about some of the stuff that's gone on in your life. And because the truth is, if you're trying to be, I'm just tough and you just try to stuff it, I'm going to tell you the Bible tells that you can't prosper when you live like that. The Bible actually teaches us that healing happens through confession. And we think, oh, confession to God? No, 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 no. To one another. Confess your sins to one another. The Bible says you will be healed. You'll be healed. In fact, that's part of the process of our freedom groups is teaching people what it means to be healed in their lives. So, So what do you need to confess? What do you need to renounce? What do you need to let go of? What happened in your past that you just don't want to talk about because it's the past and it happened and I'm just burying it. Let the Holy Spirit begin to heal you. This next one's hard and I'm just going to tell you so many people do it. And it's heartbreaking. This is really hard. And it's this, we beat ourselves up. And as your pastor today, I just need to be very honest. This is my first inclination in my life is is. Nobody else has to be hard on me because I'm harder on myself than anybody could ever be with me. Some of you right now, you are are beating yourselves up for the things that you did. And we're not here to, to tell you, oh, those things are all okay and it's no big deal. No, those things were hard. Maybe it was past sin. Maybe it was adultery. Maybe it was failure, it was addiction. As a pastor, I I, one of the things I do is I walk with people. And honestly, some of the things are very hard, very horrific, very damaging. Even this week, I was reminded of David. David, this, this man after God's own heart, King David, who had some seasons of his life where he was not the kind of man that was worth following. An adulterer a murderer, commits adultery and then covers up his own adultery and then sends the man to the front lines to be killed. That's not a good week for this man. And what actually happens in David's life is you actually begin to see these moments where the the skeletons from the past, the back, the things that used to are coming up and, and look at it, Psalm 38, I'm drowning in the flood of my sin, he says. They are a burden too heavy to bear. Because I have been foolish, I'm utterly worn out. I'm crushed. My heart is troubled. This is some people in the room today. And, and it's not just this. For some of us, we beat ourselves up for stuff we didn't even do. I, I have walked with so many families in this season, who've lost loved ones as a result of everything that's happened, they blame themselves. It's my fault. I should have done this. I should have. So some of you feel that way. It's like you're blaming yourself. Well, I shouldn't have lost my job. My family's in this season right now because I, I, I couldn't keep the job. I, I didn't do good enough. I, I, and we're just beating ourselves up. And it's not even your fault. But then there's others of us, come on, in the room. We're not, we don't blame ourselves. We do this next one. We blame everybody else around us. Anybody like this in the room, I'm not going to make you raise your hand because you'll blame me for it later. <laughs> but so, You blame everybody else except your, it's like your mom's fault. It's your dad. It was your boss. It was your spouse. It was your kids. It's the weather's fault. It's the devil. 
kids or not, you said this mentor, every time she lost her phone, it was the devil's fault. She, devil, you have stolen my phone. And I thought, pastor, that's not the devil. You just need to get more organized. <laughs> but your whole life has been a constant pattern of you blaming everybody else for everything that has ever happened in your life. And by the way, that's not new. That's been going on all the way back in the beginning in Genesis. Adam eats the food, eats the, eats the fruit that the woman gives him. God comes to him. He says, what are you doing? He says, it's the woman's fault. You put her here with me. I didn't even ask for her. It's her fault. He says it in Genesis 3, the serpent deceived me, and so I ate. What did you want me to do? I just ate the food. I'm a man. I like to eat. So what's the solution? Well, I'm going to give you a fourth one. I've given you three negative things that we do. I'm about to give you a fourth one, but I have to warn you before I give it to you. Because what I'm about to say to you, the fourth option is going to sound like the most Christianese thing that you've ever heard. And for those of you who don't know what that means, that's a language that Christians supposedly speak just through their everyday life. Like, how are you doing, brother? I'm blessed and highly favored. That's Christianese. <laughs> you say that to somebody who's not a Christian, they look at you like, what are you talking about? It's going to sound so Christianese, you're going to be tempted to turn, turn me out, tune me out, and roll your eyes. But I'm going to walk this through with you for a few minutes today. So I want to say that on the front end, but I got to give it to you. So let me give you the fourth option of what you can do is you can believe God. Listen to me. God sees your past completely different than you do. There is a problem, though. And the problem is, is that you don't believe it. You don't believe he sees your past different than you. And so if this is a problem, and the problem is for, from twisted thinking, from these ghosts of your past, so to speak, then what I have to do is I have to help you untwist that thinking in order for you to see and then try to help you believe what God says about you. Does that make sense to you today? So, so let me just start with the simple scripture. And I want it to just sit on you for a second. What about my past? What does God say about your past? Are you ready for this? This is what he says in 2 Corinthians. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ. He is a He's a new creation. The The old is gone. Listen to me. The old has gone. You are not the same person that you used to be. The old has gone. The new is come. But this ghost, this spiritual enemy keeps visiting you and telling you the old hasn't gone. The old's still here. The problem isn't that it's not gone. It's gone. The problem is that you don't believe that it's gone. And so my job isn't to take it away. I can't take away something that's not there anymore. That's Jesus' job. My job is to help you believe the word of God that says it's already gone. I've just got to help you with your belief today. See, listen to me. When you see your life in Christ, he doesn't, he's not an improver. He's an he's a newer. <laughs> He makes all things new. He doesn't give you a refurbished version of yourself. He makes all things new. Come on, how many of you are thankful that you serve a God today that makes all things new in your life? I'm preaching better than some of y'all are saying amen today. That's okay. I know it's Christmas and all that. Now, here's what I love about God. What I love about the God of the Bible is that he uses people with a past to help people with the past. Like since, since we have a past and he knew that it would be tough for us to overcome our past, he gets people with the past to help people who have a past so that they can overcome that past. 
In fact, when you look at your, your New Testament, I think this is fascinating. That God chose to use a man to write 17 of the 27 books of the New Testament that was, had a horrendous past. In fact, Paul had a lot of reason to look at his past and feel very condemned about it, to feel very guilty about it, because he, he was a killer. He killed Christians. The very people that he then tried to lead were people that he was executing. He oversaw these executions in the early church. He commanded, his command, have them killed. They were killed. It's amazing to me that God does this, that he helps people, he uses people with a past to help people who have a past. Now I want you to look at what he says in 1 Timothy. Because I think it's sort of like in his letters, you feel the tension of his life, of what I'm talking about in your life right now. Look at this. Look at this. He says, even though I was once a blasphemer or a blasphemer, a persecutor, and and look at this, violent. Like when you think about Paul, you don't think violent. But he's admitting to you, I was violent. I was abusive. I was hard. I I was shown mercy. Even though I was all these things, I was shown mercy. Because I acted in ignorance and... Uh Uh-oh. So check it out. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. Now watch this next part. I never saw this like I'm about to show it to you until this week. Check out what he says. He says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves... Come on, everybody say it real loud. It deserves full acceptance. Meaning, you've got to fully understand this and then you have to fully accept this. Because if you're struggling with your unbelief right now, well, how do you have more belief? Just get more belief, you know? That's what everybody would tell you. Are you struggling with your faith? Well, just get some more. Well, that doesn't work. How do you get more faith if you're struggling with faith? Well, what you have to do is you have to go all the way back to the fact that you've got to fully accept that from the start. Accept what? That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then Paul adds this, just in case you were wondering of which I'm the worst. That Christ died for sinners and scumbags and jerks and foul mouths and cheaters and every other choice word that you've said about yourself. Paul says, I'm the worst of those things. So if you want to have an untwisted belief system and if you want to get yourself back to where you need to be, then I've got to help you believe everybody. And so let me just give you with the 11 minutes and 14 seconds, 13 seconds, 12, 10 seconds that I have left. Let me just try to give you, let me try to give you a couple of these. Number one, you got you to gotta stop trying to earn your forgiveness. Isn't it funny that the Bible's so clear about this and yet we treat God like he's a proverbial Santa Claus? It's amazing to me. It's like, oh, I'm on the naughty list this year. Am I on the nice list this year? We treat God like it's a scale. Like on one side is all of my good deeds and on the other side is all of my sin. And I gotta make sure that this is tipped more and if it's not tipped, this is the one thing that drives me crazy about people who profess Christ because it's just absolutely not true. And so now we're walking around Christmas and we're singing our own version of the song about God that's absolutely untrue. You better watch out. You better not sin. Don't you mess up. Or God won't come in, or you'll be headed straight down to hell. <laughs> He's making a list. It has all of your past. The scales must be balanced, or you won't last, because you'll be going straight down to hell. <laughs> Y'all, I'm, I'm not the dean that can't sing, okay? I got a little bit in me, too. Don't let Pastor Dan talk bad about me, okay? That's not true. We're laughing, but it's literally the song that many Christians sing to themselves. I've got to be good enough. I've got to be good enough. I've got to be good enough. I got to do some things this Christmas to make me good enough. I got to serve. At, oh, can't serve four hours. Got to serve six hours. Because if I only serve four hours, God, that's not going to be enough for God. 
And, and, and you try to worship, you try to pray, you try to read, you come into church and you're like, I, I'm going, you know, I'm going to raise my hands today to God. So I'm looking at me. I don't know if anybody's looking at me. So you just get it. You're like right here. You know what I'm saying? And then somewhere along the way, you know, you, you, here's what you're doing. You're just holding the TV. This is where you're at right now. You're just, you're just holding the TV. You get right about here. The fish is this big. You know, the fish is this big, you know, until touchdown. And right about that time, the enemy's like, you can't be doing this. Don't you know about the club that you used to frequent? Hey. Don't you know about your past? Don't you know what you did to your wife? Don't you know how you put your kids way down on the list and you've treated work more important than them and now your kids have made decisions? It's really your fault. And you think that somehow you can come into God's house and somehow worship him and he's going to be okay with you lifting your hands like this? It's amazing to me the number of people that then come in and think, I got to do enough. I got to get God. And the problem is we say things like, well, you know, then we're talking about other people like, well, I'll forgive him, but I won't forget. I'm going to tell you something. Forgiveness has no buts. In fact, some people who come from very intense legalistic faith backgrounds often struggle with forgiveness. And the reason is because their entire life they've been taught that you have to earn it. But once you really experience forgiveness, forgiveness will always be easier for you to give. Because Jesus came to save save sinners. All of your sin has been paid for. The, The past, the present, the future. The Bible says while you were still sinning, he died for you. So so here's the problem for most people. Their belief system's off. The the people don't go to hell because of their sin. They go to hell because of their unbelief. There's not a single scripture that says, stop sinning and you'll be saved. It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Ephesians 2 says, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This has nothing to do with anything that you've done. There's no scale. There's nothing you can stack on it to make it way out the right way. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no man can boast. And so once we receive that, then the Bible gives us a command. Freely you have received, so freely give. Why does it say that this has nothing to do with money? This has everything to do with every part of your life because once you receive it, all of a sudden now you can start to give it. The problem with our world, don't be surprised when the whole world's condemning each other and talking about each other on the news and being all ugly. They don't understand the grace that God has freely given. But once you understand the grace, all of a sudden you can give it. You can come up on a Saturday and love people to life. You can go into your workplace and love people with no conditions. You can love your spouse and forgive your spouse. Forgiveness isn't hard if you focus on what God has given you because when you understand it, you have no desire but to want to give it. But the bad thing about ghosts is they try to come back. And that's why this next one's so huge. That's why you got to make sure you do this one in your life because these ghosts will try to mess with you. And it's not like one day you're just like, you're you're done. And then they're like, ah, never coming back. No, they... They keep trying. They try to sneak in in different ways. That's why you got to defeat every lie with the truth. See, the worst news is that some of you, you, you can't forget what you've done. And I want you to hear me say this today. You won't forget what you've done. You're not going to forget it. So when the enemy tries to come back, tries to remind you of your betrayals and your bad choices and your wrongs and your mistakes and your sins, you better be armed with God's word. Because the enemy is a master liar. He does it nonstop. He's he's not only doing it all all the time. The Bible says he's the master at it. John 8, when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar. He is the father of all lies. Revelation 12 tells us that he stands before God all the time accusing the brethren, accusing you of things that you've done. The Lord won't listen. So he puts, he, he turns his head. He, he won't listen to all that stuff. So what does he do? He turns to us 
And he starts whispering that stuff to us. And we go right back. It's like we come to church. Oh, I went to freedom. Or I did this. And all of a sudden, three months later, you're right back because that enemy is coming right back. So when that happens, you better have the truth of God's word. He's in your ear, yeah, 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 telling you all this stuff. Well, wait a second. If that's true, why does it say that God's made us right with God, that he's made us pure and holy, and he freed me from sin? That I'm not bound by the things that have happened to me in my past. I get to live out free because of Jesus Christ and what he paid for me and he shed his blood on Calvary. People often ask, well, Dusty, help me be like God. I just, I want to forget sin like God forgets all the sin. Listen to me. God does not forget sin. I need you to understand this. The Bible never says that God forgets sin. God is omniscient, therefore he is all-knowing. If he were to not know something, he, that would not make him all omniscient. He knows it all. So when it says in the scripture that he remembers sin no more, it's a really a bad translation. The translation really is that he chooses not to remember. He chooses not to bring it up. He refuses to let that become an issue between the two of you. He chooses not to remember. You want to be like God in your life? Choose not to remember. Ladies, let me, let me talk to you for just a second. You have, you have an amazing memory. <laughs> Kendra remembers everything that I have said. She's like, you said blankety blank. I, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. When did I say that? August 4th, 2013. <laughs> I'm like, no, there's like a rule. It's after seven days, it's void. You know, like <laughs> you can't bring it up anymore. You have to use, you have to use current stuff. <laughs> and then other days, Kendra will say, you're so forgiving. And I'm like, honestly, no, I'm not. I just really can't remember what we argued about. <laughs> In fact, two nights ago, we got in a little, we were arguing about something, and she said, do you not remember having this conversation two weeks ago? And I went, no. <laughs> Can you remind me? I sort of, I just. <sighs> All the men said, amen. <laughs> Listen to me when I say this, and I, I'm joking. I, I do mean this sincerely. It can be a curse if you're not careful. And whoever you are, male or female, listen to me. Choose to remember it no more. Choose to let it go. I'm trying to help you today. Stop trying to earn it. Better know God's truth. And then here's the last one I'm closing today. Bang, he's right there, ready to go. <laughs> Number three, allow God to turn it around. Allow him to take a really bad situation. See, he has this ability that whenever tragedy occurs or whenever you do something that you think there's no way he could turn this, how in the world can he use this? He has this uncanny ability to turn it around. And, and listen to me, when it happens, you have the choice. You can wallow in it, or you can ask God to use it. Here's Paul, this man that has murdered Christians. And I know he, he was haunted by his past. I know he was. Because he says things like, Constantly trying to forget what is behind, to move to where to what is ahead, you know. In fact, when you go and you read Paul's words, you'll see a lot of him letting go of the past, like trying to move that out. And I think he talked about that a lot because he struggled with it a lot. And that's why in Romans eight he makes this powerful statement. It's my favorite. I think if you had to bottle it down, there's so many, but if you had to bottle it down to two or three, this is, this is top of the list for me in Romans chapter 8. And we know that in all things, 
God works for the good of those who love him who've been called according to his purpose. Now listen to me. Some of you know that in your head. But you got to believe this in your heart. You can't know it. You got to believe it. You got to believe that when you're the scum of the earth and you've done things that you think you can't come back from, God can bring you back from it. You hear what I'm saying to you today? You, you know Joseph's story. He's sold into slavery. He's lied to. He's thrown into prison. He's falsely accused. He's betrayed. All of it. You can read about it in Genesis, I think, 45 and 50 and those particular passages. But years later, God uses this situation. And I'm sure when, I'm sure when Joseph was sitting in that jail cell, I'm sure that he was saying, how are you going to use it? How are you going to turn this around? And through this crazy series of events, he's now second in the kingdom next to the king. And there's a famine in the land. And here comes these brothers that have thrown him into the pit and sold him into slavery and done all these horrible things to him. And now they come needing food, not knowing that he's where he is. And they see him. Can you imagine their faces? We're dead. And they see him, and it's this, if you could put it in a movie form, you know, it would be such a, a moment of what's he going to do, you know, what, what's he going to say? And in Genesis 50, I, I love what he says here. He says, you intended to harm me. But look at what he says. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. See, see what the devil tried to do? And, and what he tried to ruin me with, God's using it to change life. He's using me beyond my imagination. He's, he's got a purpose for my pain. He's going to do something great through my past. I'm just trying to help you get past your past. But first, you got to believe that Jesus has done it for you. So stop trying to earn forgiveness. Come on, and then be armed with God's word. And lastly, come on, let him use it for your good, everybody. If I were to summarize this message with one verse, it would be this verse in Abraham. Abraham speaking. And uh, before he became a father of many nations, like the scripture says, he was jacked up. In Romans 4, we get a sneak peek into his life. Look at this. It says, what does the scripture say? It says that Abraham believed God. And because he not doesn't say he did a lot of great things, it doesn't say he was credited because he deserved it, because he, he made right everything that he had done in his past. He just came to a point where he believed that the greater days were in front of him than the days that were behind him. And he believed God, and God credited it to him as righteousness. See, listen to me. You don't need more forgiveness. You don't need more forgiveness of yourself. All you need is faith. You just have to believe what this book says about you. And it'll change your life. Amen, everybody. <laughs> Bow your heads with me today. I just, I want to know who I'm talking to. I, without a lot of fluff and without a lot of anything else, if you, if you are one of these people right now, for whatever reason, you're struggling right now with your past, struggling with something that's happened, something you've done, something that's made you feel shame or unworthy. With nobody looking around, but just as your pastor, just I want to know who I'm talking to today because the Lord put you on my mind this week, and I've been thinking about you all week. And if that's you, just wave your hand at me so I know who I'm talking to. That's me. Pastor Dustin, I'm dealing with this junk. I've got this going on in my life. You can put your hands down, lots of you today. It's not surprising because it's something a lot of us struggle with. Father, in this moment, I want to pray for every person under the sound of my voice that is plagued by the ghosts that are speaking this Christmas to the things they've done. And I'm not here to try to figure out why they did it. I'm, I'm sure that they've even asked that question themselves. But Lord, I just know this, that you're a God who forgives. You're a God that wants to make the, the, the future days greater than the former. 
You're a God that's going to make all things new. You're a God that lets go. You're a God that chooses not to remember. And if this is you right now and you know, man, I've just got this past. Here's what I want you to do in this moment, just between you and God. Let him speak to you and speak to him. Say, God, today I want to lay it down. I'm sorry. I've failed you so many times. I've failed myself. I've failed my family. But today, God's saying there's a new day ahead of you now. Father, under the sound of my voice, I ask that you not just forgive them because you've already done that, but that you would help them with their belief that you really do forgive them, that you set them free. And Lord, we just look to you right now. I, I thank you that your spirit's going to come into every person that's hurting this Christmas and that's in need of that forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus. Now, under the sound of my voice, I pray for every person who just needs a touch from the Holy Spirit, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional, whether they're trying to forgive somebody else. Remember, freely it's been given to you. Freely you've received, so freely give. Father, I pray right now for their hearts. I pray for their emotions. I pray that you'd be close this Christmas season. I speak to every person, even those watching online right now, that you administer strength and hope to each one of them. And I thank you for it right now. I I sense the healing power of Jesus just coming into this room to somebody's heart right now. Let you know you're not alone. You're not alone. You're not alone. He's with you. He's for you. We thank you for that. Holy Spirit, Jesus' name. Come on, say amen with me today. Do you feel that with me today? Do you feel this peace? Come on, let's clap our hands and thank God for that. Amazing. All right, while you're getting your stuff situated and all that kind of stuff, I I do want to make just a couple of quick things. Number one, today's Baptism Sunday. If you've not been baptized or had a meaningful baptism experience in your life, I think we're already baptizing several after the service today. Uh, And uh, so excited for that. If you see that, cheer them on, celebrate them. If you'd like to be baptized, we call it spontaneous baptisms. We do them every third Sunday throughout the year. Today's no exception. So out in the lobby, our baptism team will be out there in front of the fountain uh, to greet you. Just tell them, hey, I want to be baptized. We've got everything you need to do it spontaneously. You can also plan it if you'd like to. The third Sunday in January or in February and March, we do it every. So you bring your family. You can make it a big celebration. And there's not really a lot you need to bring because we've got it all planned for you, okay? So we've got everything that you could need uh, to be baptized. Donna's back there today. Wave at everybody. She'll be out in the lobby today. The second thing I just want to say is some of you haven't given in the legacy offering yet for whatever reason you've been waiting. Some people tell me, Pastor Jesse, I'm going to give. I just, I don't get this amount of money until the very end of the year. And so I give it this time. And if that's the case, love you. I do want to say this, that... 2021, it's been the greatest year of participation. More people have participated than ever. And because of that, it's been the greatest legacy offering that we've ever had in the history of our church. And I just want to celebrate that. You're an amazing church. In the middle of a pandemic and all of it, it's just our church continues over and over and over to blow my ever stinking mind. And I just want to thank you for being the most for being the most generous church in the world to help us love people to life in Jesus. You guys are awesome, and I love you so much. Some of you, I won't see you again because you're headed out of town this week, so I won't see you again until the first of the year. Know that your pastors love you. Kendra and I, we're praying for you. So stand on your feet today. We're going to pray you out of here, and uh, our team will worship you out. If you want to give, there are different ways that you can give. I think they'll go up on the screen behind me here in just a second. Uh, But there are boxes that are out in the hallway, envelopes behind seats. Just figure it out. You know me. I don't talk about this a lot. But I'll say this. Just do what God says. He'll bless you every time for it. Father, I pray for the holiday season, for family, for protection, for safety. I pray right now that it's a great time spent with families. I pray for those that are traveling this week and the next week. Pray your blessing wraps around them and stays with them. And I just thank you for this year for what a year it's been in so many ways. We look forward to what you want to do in the future, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. 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 I love you guys. Come on, team, sing us out today, and you're dismissed. Have a great week, everybody. 
We'll see you out in the lobby if we haven't met you.